Uh, hi folks, uh, my name is Taylor. I am a uh, senior GSS student at RPI, and this is a lecture on uh, chiptune music, uh, which is electronic music made in, uh, with video game technology. Um, so the program we'll be using today is Famitracker. It is a, a free um, Windows and sometimes Mac <laughs> program that um, runs uh, and emulates the Rico 2A03, which is the chip that was found in the Famicom and the Nintendo Entertainment System. So you can find that at Famitracker.com. And uh, the download you want is uh, version 4.6. Um, there is a 5.0 fork up there, but um, the beta, rather. But it's a little finicky, so for the sake of stability, we'll be using 4.6 today. Um, let's see. So for the version that I have that I'll be using, it'll be... Um, oops, let me minimize that. There we go. Um, the version that I'm using is actually um, a fan-made fork called um, OCC Family Tracker, but it's basically the same thing. Um, I'm just using it for this lecture so I don't have to like re-edit all of my file directories and all that stuff. Um, but basically OCC is basically Family Tracker, but it has things like multi-chip support, um, so you can use more than one expansion chip at the same time. Um, it has find and replace, hey Catherine. Um, it has um, groove settings and fixed speed and tempo, things like that. But um, for all intents and purposes, don't worry about it. Also, mine looks a little different because I added some color schemes to mine. So don't worry about that. Kind of like paint on a car. Um, so let's see. So a tracker is a music sequencer that represents music on a timeline with channels. Um, you might have seen different uh, digital audio workstations, DAWs, like FL Studio uh, or something like that. Um, Renoise, I can't think of all of them. Reaper. Um, those usually work horizontally. You read it from right to left like a book. Not us. Um, with trackers, um, oftentimes we work up to down, vertically. So you'll hit enter and the whole thing will scroll through like that. There are numbers and columns on the side that can help us figure out kind of what space we are and we can enter it at, uh, almost like a grid, I guess you could say. So, um, and that's what Family Tracker is. There are different ones that emulate different um, other uh, chips like uh, I think Milky, Milky Tracker does the Commodore 64, uh, Let's see, Defil Mask does the Sega Genesis, the YM2612, stuff like that. But um, we're using Nintendo because that's what, <laughs> that's what my specialty is. So um, to navigate Famitracker when you open it up, um, you, can, uh, click on, you can click on a certain part of the grid and then your mouse will go to that position. Um, you can double click to select an entire uh, column uh, if you wanted to, let's say, you had, um, I don't know, a bunch of, uh, sorry, let's say you had a bunch of notes and you just wanted to, I don't know, uh, delete them all, control X, or you wanted to paste them somewhere else, controls, uh, control V, or you wanted to delete them all, etc. Um, you can mute channels by, let's say that we have, let's just open up a, let's just open up something, I don't know. Um, so you got a song like this and you wanted to just hear um, the pulse, pulse one for example, then you could double click on it, see how it's made all the other ones red around it. That means that none of these are playing and the one that is not red is, or you can, um, you can just click it and it'll mute that specific channel. Um, the arrow keys can move you up and down, left and right, um, if you want to be precise. And um, yeah, so that's, that's basic navigation. Um, Right, so in the top left we've got our song settings. I'll open up a blank file um, so that you can see what's going on here. Um, let's close this out too. There we go. Um, so on the, on the top left with song settings, you can see um, speed, tempo, rows, and frames. And um, basically rows are these, um, rows are these uh, horizontal bars and rows make up frames essentially. A whole frame is kind of like a measure of a song. So if we increase the, to explain, it's kind of an uh, awkward way to explain it, but if we, you can see that we have, um, oh, Family Tracker counts in hexadecimal, by the way. So it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. So um, right now we have 64 rows, which means that our um, frame goes up to 3F, but then if I increase that number by clicking this, then you can see it's increasing as well. So we have more space here to work with. Hey, and um, additionally, um, right now, we also only have one frame. So um, when our song is finished, 
it goes right back to the beginning of frame zero, zero. But we can increase that by toggling this button, and then now we have, for example, two frames, and three and four. And now it looks kind of this similar because I haven't added any notes yet, but now when zero, zero on the top left is done, it goes to zero, one. See, zero, zero to zero, one. So um, rows and frames are basically ways that you can make sure that your song is long enough to fit whatever you need. Um, and then speed and tempo are um, speed. <laughs> tempo is a more precise setting uh, to change the the uh, quickness of a song or the the speed. And then um, speed is is a vast change. So let me open up a an example song and just show you the changes of that. This is just a test thing that I loaded up. So at first the speed is six and the tempo is 160. So it sounds like this. Now if we change um, speed, it makes pretty big leaps. As you can see, if I change it to four, it'll go. But um, because, uh, because tempo is a larger number, it means we can make more precise changes. So 165 is only a slight increase. So there you go. Um, speed, is, speed is bigger changes, tempo is smaller ones. Rows and frames are how we determine the length of our song. Um, do we have any questions so far? Uh, all right, good. Um, so um, the next thing that I would recommend you do is we go to, f we could uh, open up a blank one. Sorry that I keep jumping around. We'll go to file and then configuration. And then in configuration, uh, there should be, yep, shortcuts. So once again, you go to file and then configuration and shortcuts. And I recommend, this is just preference, but I, I think it's pretty useful change decrease octave and increase octave to the left and right uh, square bracket keys. Um, mostly because uh, it just makes things easier rather than go up here and change this. So once again, that's file, configuration, and uh, file configuration shortcuts and decrease and increase octave. Um, it might look slightly different on your version of Famous Tracker. Um, but basically, um, an octave is uh, an octave is a series of eight notes that denotes how high or low the pitch is. It's a way in which we group pitch. So um, a, a C a C three, so third octave, is that, and a C four, which is up eight notes, is there. You go. So basically, um, the brackets just let us switch quickly. That's what I prefer, at least. Um, you can customize it how you like, though. Um, Okay, so now let's move on to um, explaining all of this with the different channels, what we can do. So this is a standard NES layout right here, this area. And um, that means that we have pulse 1, pulse 2, triangle, noise, and DPCM. And all of these, uh, all of these parts of the chip, if you will, all these instruments, um, play a different role. Um, so Pulse 1 and 2 are usually used for melody and harmony, and that means that it's usually the lead of the song um, for Mario that's do 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 and then for uh, Pulse 2, it harmonizes with it, so that's like, um, so then they kind of go together, like, I don't know, ugh, look at me not making instruments, but just for example, this and this, they sound like this, like that. Um, triangle is a warmer, lower instrument that we often use for bass in games, um, with chiptune at least. Um, it's, uh, it has a few different properties that make it different from pulse one and two, which I'll explain as we go. But it sounds kind of like this. Uh, it's a very low sound, um, and they're also, uh, it's kind of a lower volume too. So often when we work with triangle, we often have to think about how we're mixing our song, how all the instruments are sitting together. Um, noise is literally white noise, kind of like the hissing and the statics that you hear on a dead TV, for example. Um, we actually make it kind of crackle and pop, and that's how we do percussion. If you think about it, a snare is kind of like a hissing noise or a snap or something like that. Um, of course, there are other ways that we can use that channel, but that's just one of the general ways. So if I make a quick, uh, I don't know. And don't worry, I know I'm going fast, but I'll explain how what I'm doing with all these instruments as we go. This is more a demonstration, but... Um, sounds kind of like that. 
um, and you can make it hiss and growl and all sorts of things. And then DPCM finally is our sample channel. Um, you'll notice that with all the, all the music we've made so far, the sounds are literally things coming from the chip, things that we made. But DPCM is sampled, meaning that we literally took a recording of, I don't know, a drum, uh, an instrument, someone yelling, I don't know. Um, and then we're playing it back with the chip, to use his memory. Um, a lot of times we'll use this as um, like additional sampled drums. Um, for older games, this is how they put in voice, like little clips of people yelling, hey, or, or touchdown, or whatever. Um, but this was really expensive back in the day, DPCM, because um, it, it took up a large amount of memory to record a sound, so um, sometimes you had to pick whether you wanted certain fidelity or you wanted more levels or characters or something like that. Um, making sure everything fit back then with the limitations was very, very um, important. And limitations are something that we have to work with pretty much every day when we use Fan Tracker. So, in conclusion uh, for this section, uh, Pulse 1 and 2 are normally melody and harmony. They're the kind of the bright, strong, uh, vibrant instruments. Um, Hi there. Um, triangle is our lower, warmer instrument that's often used for bass. Noise is our white noise that we use for percussion, and DBCM is our sampling. Um, and that's that. Um, so let's make an instrument. I'm going to free up my, my space so that we have uh, just a blank canvas, same as you. And then I can go right here into the Add Instrument uh, button. That's right below the uh, that's right below the instrument box where they're all listed. As uh, and I can click it and make a new instrument. Oh, and by the way, just briefly, um, these are buttons like New, Open, File, Save. Uh, play, stop, record, um, octaves, um, and then right here is right here is where we write our music, the sequencer, if you will. Um, this is the uh, this selects uh, rows and frames, and this is instruments, and then right here is song information. Uh, so you can credit yourself when you're done, I guess. <laughs> so um, let's make a new instrument, and then when you click the add instrument button, it'll show up right here as zero zero. So we they are listed. Uh, with a number as well as a name. We can name this uh, um, lead, I guess. Why not? Um, and then you can double click it and you'll open up the instrument editor. So um, once again, just to demonstrate, just double click that and you'll open up the instrument editor. Um, so here are the different uh, qualities you can modify to uh, change the way the instrument is, uh, the, the qualities and the effects of it. Um, volume literally changes the, the shape of the waveform of the instrument. Maybe you put certain sounds into Audacity um, or, or a similar program and you've seen the actual waves and, and signs and whatnot that make up the sound of an instrument and you'll notice that a lot of them are different. If you think about it, uh, a, something that's a little more percussive, like a piano, has a really hard um, attack at the beginning of the note and then it kind of gracefully trails off if you hold the key down. And kind of naturally changes. You can think about the shape of instruments and the way that they, that affects the way they sound, and then you can kind of draw it out here by, um, by changing the volume. So um, we can change the volume in a variety of ways. So we can hit this plus button, and that'll change the amount of space we have to draw a waveform, if you will. I'm not actually sure what the correct terminology for that, but I'll call it the waveform for now. Um, or you can just type it in right here. Maybe I'll put two, four, six, seven, four, nine, uh, 10. There you go. And then once you hit enter, it'll draw. Hey there. Um, but then, um, depending on how much space you have, you can hold down the mouse and just kind of shape it, the instrument, however you like. Um, Kirby instruments, for example, are really fond of doing this. They like the, the gradual sweeps. Um, and then when you press a key, you can hear it kind of floats in. A little bit like a violin. I like to use it that way, at least. Um, Capcom instruments, like Mega Man, specifically like to do um, this pattern, 0, 15, 12. Very articulated, very specific um, start to a note and end to a note. Um, so then you can have like... <laughs> missed the last note. Um, and then, uh, so then let's listen, for example, if I draw this, this waveform, 0, 15, 12. Sounds like this. And then if I uh, draw a more, uh, a longer, more uh, crescendo-induced waveform like this, sounds like this. Kind of floats in. So we can see how, uh, with our instruments, 
we have to choose things that fit the sound that we're going for. Um, all right, so then, oh, one more thing that I should tell you is that um, if you put, uh, let's see, let's just demonstrate like this. There we go. Um, I'm going to show you a few different, uh, one little trick that we have that is articulation. So um, if you imagine someone kind of, uh, if you imagine someone kind of singing, they can go, um, ooh. Now I just sang that sequence of notes and I didn't stop my, my breath in between all of them. It was one kind of slide, glissando, if you will. Um, or you can articulate it, do, 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 do. And then you have a stop. You actually stop in between each note. And that's just, um, you know, how the musician wants to do that. But um, keep in mind that Famitracker Tracker does not automatically put spaces in between notes. If you want to, you have to put it in yourself. So, um, so if we do this, it just, um, even, we can look right here at the, at the screen section, it's not stopping the sound at any time. But if we add, for example, a zero before it, so now we've got zero fifteen. The note starts with a quick, brief cut right here. There's no volume at that zero. Then, very briefly, you can hear a little bit more articulation at the beginning of a note. So make sure you're keeping in mind how much sound you've got and um, kind of how you're shaping your instruments in that regard. Um, cool. Um, so the next thing that we can change with our instruments is arpeggios. Um, and arpeggios are kind of broken chords um, to, in, in standard vernacular. Uh, a chord is multiple notes held together at the same time. Um, it can be, you can have minor, minor chords, major, major chords, but they're combinations of notes that make different harmonizations and sounds together. So, C, E, and G. Oop. Ah, isn't that nice? Uh, <laughs> that's a C and E and a G, so that's a C major, for example. Um, but um, what if we what if we want to make a, a what if we want to make um, a chord? We want to play a chord in Famitracker right now with four notes or something. Well, we don't have enough room to do that. We only have three channels that can make a melodic note, technically. So then we could break up the chord and kind of um, play it in, I don't know, well, actually, uh, so then basically we could break up the chord and play it in one channel, saving space while also giving the general, to the listener, the general vibe of the chord. That's a really awkward way to put it, but let me demonstrate. So, um, so zero, 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 let's see, it'd be one, and then one, two, three, four. And four, 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 um, and then five, six, seven. That should work. Um, and then if I hit C, yeah, there we go. Um, and then, so basically, if you, if you listen really closely, actually I'll add more zeros and fours to demonstrate this. Um, we're trying to hit multiple notes with one with one channel at a time in order to save space. So um, if I hit a C, that's um, oh and by the way when it's when we're counting these arpeggio numbers they show um, these numbers in the arpeggio section are showing how many notes we are um, playing relative to the root note. So the root note is a zero. Um, I start by hitting the C key. So I want to hit C and then E and then G. So um, the amount of steps from that is C, and then C sharp, and then D, and then D sharp, and then E. So that's four notes away. And then um, F, and then F sharp, and then G. And that's seven notes away from the original zero. So if I want to hit C, E, and G, I'm kind of counting up. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Zero, four, seven. Um, so then if I play it, I did hit all of them. But we basically gave a command to play um, to play zero, four, and seven, so that kind of uh, that breaks up the chord. Um, and the reason I put so many zeros, fours, and sevens are in there is because um, it actually, if you look really closely when I hit the note, the green is actually showing how quickly it travels, um, and it travels through the arpeggio at a pretty quick rate. So then, if I just put zero, four, seven. Um, it goes through it real quick. So um, you'll have to measure how um, how quickly you want your arpeggio to carry out, but that's just one thing that you can do. Um, a lot of people break up chords 
with very small amounts of space um, if they're not using any expansion ships or things like that. Or you can even loop it and it'll sound like like that. So the looping function, um, if I, you can do that by left clicking down here. Sorry about that. Um, you can left click and then drag it to whatever part you'd like. Um, the looping function says um, whatever notes, whatever, whatever commands are beyond this end will carry out indefinitely. I'll loop it. Um, so then, like that, or that. So then you can do some pretty crazy things if you want to make lots of insane noises and go like that. <laughs> um, another thing you can do is uh, the release function. Oh, by the way, if you want to just remove the loop, um, just drag it to the end and then let go. Um, and then another thing you can do is release with the right mouse. So left mouse is uh, left mouse controls loop down here, and right controls release. And then um, release means that um, the note will uh, release. Basically, means that from here on out, when the note is released, uh, for instance, if a key is released from the piano, then the note travels out. Um, but I can hold down this key right here. For example, I can hold down this note. And it's holding that first point of release, and then when you let go, it carries out the. It should carry out the rest of it. <laughs> um, let's see if it'll. Oh, I know. Um, okay. Well, normally it does. Uh, I'm, I probably have some error, but um, you can also do that with volume. As well, you can do loop and release here, um, but uh, I wouldn't worry about it for now because we're just making basic instruments. Um, pitch and high pitch are two options that have kind of been made obsolete recently by certain commands in the effects channel, so I wouldn't worry about those. And then duty noise is really, really fun. Um, oh, uh, by the way, you can turn on and off volume and arpeggio and pitch and high pitch by clicking on these. But keep in mind that the, each of the functions you store, if you will, this sequence, is stored in a certain spot. Um, for us, it's zero, 00 because it's the first one, but if you wanted to make a new sequence and save the old one, just hit up or hit select next empty slot, and it'll automatically go to that. Um, but anyway, duty and noise is really fun because it changes how, it changes um, the active state of the, uh, of the waveform. And by that, it changes the sound of the note. So right now we've got, um, the standard pulse right now is, uh, let's change that. Um, duty noise zero, zero. So then if we, if we change it to 1 and play the note again, sounds different. Change it to 2, sounds even more different. Um, and then 3 is, sounds pretty identical to 1. But um, you can change, um, you can also add different uh, sequences to this too, of course. You can have... So you can get some pretty cool sounds that way too. Um, Oh, one last thing I should mention. Um, uh, I know we're going pretty quick here, so I'll ask for questions in a minute, and then we can take anything if you have any questions. But feel free to shout them out, too, as we go. Um, the speed at which Famine Tracker runs through this sequence, or, or that arpeggio sequence that I was making, or any, any kind of sequence in the instrument editor, depends on the speed of the internal clock. Um, and you can... Uh, you don't have to do this, but just to clean up engine speed. Yeah, so the engine the engine normally runs at 60 hertz, but um, some people are real speed demons and they like to crank it up to 400 hertz and that makes all sorts of kind of strange effects. Um, a lot of people that make dubstep and stuff with, with Family Tracker like to, like to make, they like to overclock the NES so then it, it makes it really growly and screechy and they can do, you know, all sorts of crazy effects like that. So, um, in short, volume is how we control the shape of the note when the note is played. Arpeggio lets us break up chords um, if we want to do effects or save space. Um, pitch and high pitch you don't really have to worry about, and duty and noise uh, change the active state of the wave and change the overall sound. Um, am I going too fast so far? Are we good? Any major questions? We're going to keep going with this too, so don't worry. Um, one thing that we do need... Uh, yep, okay. I'm just checking out things as we go. Um, another thing that we should keep in mind is um, triangle, the triangle channel. As I said, it was different. 
Um, but it's different in the way that it is not affected mostly by the volume. Uh, uh, the volume nor the duty noise. If I change the duty noise settings on a triangle, If I change the duty noise on a triangle, then it actually doesn't affect the sound because that's just one of the rules. It probably has to do with the way the triangle wave is set up, but unfortunately that's something I don't know. But um, if we change the volume as well, um, the, the actual loudness of the note is not affected either. However, it is affected by on and off um, because the... Oops, sorry, got to click out. So um, from this we can tell that the triangle, um, the triangle channel is only affected by an on and off state. It can't really be modified that much, but um, you can do a lot of cool things with it if you... Um, right now we're only hearing it in a low register. But if I bring it up for it to higher octaves, you can get a pretty cool sound of it too. Um, I think the Kirby games even used it for woodblock, um, kind of like a percussion woodblock. Um, so yeah, that's, alright, so let's keep going, and let's see if we can make the basic form of the song. Um, so, um, go ahead and make an instrument called lead, um, and then make the, make the volume anything you'd like. Maybe you'd like to draw a more, um, maybe you'd like to draw a more fade-in instrument. Maybe you'd like to draw something really harsh, or something that fades off. Um, anything is fine, really. But, um go on and change that, you can change your volume. Um, I'd leave out the arpeggio for now, um, pitch and high pitch, and then just focus on volume and duty noise. Find a duty and duty noise cycle that you like. Um, I like one, so I'm gonna stick with one, but you can do two, you can do zero. And then, um, once you've got that set up, that'll be our lead instrument that'll control pulse one and pulse two. So go on and take a minute and make that. Okay, and um, so next, um, oh, that'll also be our triangle. So now let's make noise, um, literally. <laughs> Get it, noise. Um, <laughs> so go on and make another instrument. We'll call this a uh, snare or drum or anything you like. This will be our noise channel instrument. Um, and for this one, you really don't want, um, for now, we don't want noise to, uh, to, for noise to stick around for too long because then there will be a hiss over the entire song. So I'd recommend that it, um, you draw a waveform for your noise, and then make sure it ends with a zero. So um, I usually draw something like this for a drum, because it's a loud hit, it's like bang, and then it's got a definitive end, kind of, that sort of thing. Um, so go ahead and make a, um, and make a volume uh, pattern for your drum instrument. And then uh, make sure it ends with a zero. And then when you're done with that, we're just about ready to make a song. We'll skip DPCM for now just because um, I, I'll, I'll demonstrate how to load and import DPCM, but you don't have any at the moment that you can readily access. I probably should have put one up, but I apologize. Um, but it's very easy, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so go on and hit space. You'll enter recording mode. I believe it'll glow red for you. It's blue for me because I have a different color scheme on mine. Um, if you hit space, you can go into edit mode. Um, edit or record mode is if, well, first of all, if we just hit keys, nothing's actually being changed on it. But if you hit space, you can actually write notes into the specific parts. So go on ahead, hit space, and try writing down a few notes. It really doesn't matter what you do. I'm more showing you how the instruments work in tandem at the moment. Um, And then um, in triangle, go ahead and change that. And then in snare, in or in drum. Uh, oh, and make sure you can um, you can click on the instruments up in the instrument selection box to uh, tell you which instrument you're currently writing with. Um, and actually, I was writing with the wrong one, so <laughs> that's that's why we check. Um, and then. Um, if you're uh, writing with the wrong one, I'm not sure what it is in normal fa family tracker, but you should be able to right-click and hit replace instrument. So
something like that. For me, it's pattern and then replace instrument. And it'll change the pattern. For example, if I want to switch this to 0, 1, uh, I'm currently working with instrument 0, 0. You can go to pattern and then replace instrument, and it's rewritten it like that. Um, there we go. Um, and then go into, so pulse 1, pulse 2, and triangle should probably be written with your lead instrument that we just made. And then snare or drum uh, should probably be what you use in the noise channel. So I'm going to write some, some pretty intense hardcore drums. <laughs> and then leave DPCM blank. So uh, let's see. Great. And with that, you can hit enter and listen to the beautiful music you've made. Very nice. Uh, thank you. We're all musicians now. Um, so um, you now understand how the how the instruments work together. It didn't sound so great, but don't worry. Um, you hopefully, I'm hoping you all attended Taylor Methay's music theory lecture last time. So now you know all know how to do harmonization and chords and keys and stuff like that. I hope she explained all that stuff. Um, but uh, anyway, that's how that works. So let me briefly explain um, the, uh, the instrument rows, if you will, and tell you a little bit about what all these numbers and shapes mean. Um, wow, that was just, that was, I've been doing this for three years and that might have been the worst song I've made so far. Um, I always make a different one. Uh, <laughs> so C5, for example, here's our, here's our note right here. C5 means that we're playing the note C in the octave 5. Um, octaves in Family Tracker go from 0 to 7. So that means it's pretty high. It's a, a higher pitch note. C5. Zero, 0 is the instrument we made it with. We made it with this instrument lead, 0, zero up here. Um, and I just added these to demonstrate. 6 is the volume. Now, you might be saying, uh, Taylor, we, uh, we already made the volume over here. And that's true, you did. You did the shape of the instrument. But sometimes, for example, maybe you want a trumpet in your, in, in your orchestra to play loudly during one section and softly during another. Well, in that case, then you're going to want to change it manually with the volume number right here. Um, these go from, these are hexadecimal as well, just like everything else. So you're going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. 0 to F. Um, F is very loud, 0 is no sound at all, 1 is very quiet, etc. Um, one thing that you should all keep in note is that Famine Tracker does um, absolute volume, so if you change, if you set something to volume D for this first note, it will stay D for the remainder of the song until you change it or cut the sound or whatever. Um, it does not revert back to your original, whatever sound you had it at originally, so. Um, but that means that you can also do, do cool things like this. Maybe I'll make this kind of uh, decrease, and then uh, if we listen to this, I'm changing the volume, it kind of fades away. So you can do lots of cool effects like that, but um, maybe in a certain section I'll have the drums come in at volume F with a really loud cymbal crash, and then I'll bring it down for um, brushes on a snare drum. Anything, use your imagination. Um, as we said before, triangle is not affected by the volume command. Don't be fooled. Um, don't be fooled. Um, even in, lots of people do get fooled. In the original Shovel Knight master files, uh, there were volume commands on triangle. That's, that's a major no-no. Um, <laughs> and then uh, right here is the effect column. And we'll go into effects later. Um, that was actually one of the big requests I got last year to handle more of that this time. And I brought example files this time, so guilty as charged. Uh, but basically, um, P tells us that we're using the effect P. And then 8.0 is the uh, qualifiers for it, the intensity of the, the effect. Um, so uh, one more time, that's uh, note, octave, instrument, volume, effect. Um, sound good so far? All right. Um, let's see. Space to record. Uh, explain. Yep. Make a song. We did make a song. Oh, we made a song. We made an excellent song. Um, rows or spaces? Yep. Okay. So. Um, Demonstrate importation and effects. Okay, so I'll show you how to, uh, I will show you now how to import DPCM, this channel that was has been eluding us so far. So um, I would, uh, generally common practice is you make a new instrument for DPCM, I'll do that. Um, you could even add, add this to the song you just wrote. 
you don't have to w make a blank one. Um, oh, don't forget to save people if you're working on stuff. Don't 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 let your computer crash and then lose files. Um, save all the time because there's no auto save in Family Tracker. Um, I make a so I'm making a new instrument. Um, I probably should have kept my old song, but whatever. Uh, and that's called DPCM. And then if you open up the instrument editor while selected in the DPCM channel, you'll see all this really cool stuff here. And this tells us how we can assign, load, and screw around with samples. So um, to load a standard DPCM sample, you'll need the file format DMC. I'm going to provide a number of samples to Ryan, and he will later on, and he'll have a way to distribute it to you guys. But for now, we'll just demonstrate. Um, I have a couple samples here that I made myself. Um, most of them. Uh, some of them I found from other other people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, if we click on it, we can actually hear what it sounds like. I think. Yep. So you can have. There you go. Um, normally, um, as you can tell, I usually use uh, I usually use percussion for my DPCM, but people use it in a variety of ways, um, even other instruments, which I'll show you as we go. But right now I'll just import self-kick, which is a kick drum, uh, and then uh, self-snare, which is a snare drum. And then, so we've got these loaded. We hit load and we chose the samples that we've got right here. Um, this tells us the size, this tells us the name and the number. Um, and then these are all uh, the keys, literally the notes that we can play when we play this instrument. And right now, if we use this instrument in the DPCM channel, there's no sound because we didn't assign any of the samples to the keys. But now we can. So, um, for example, you can select uh, C3 and self-kick and hit the left arrow and that moves the sample over to the, uh, to the key. Um, you can then do that with self-snare. So I put mine on C3 and C-sharp 3. Um, and now, if I'm in the octave 3, and then I press the C key, so C3. Gonna work? There we go. Um, I can actually play that note. So, then if I press C sharp 3, the sample has been loaded. So, um, that's how you do stuff like that. Um, and then if we press enter, we can hear it. So um, one last thing I want to tell you is that um, you can also set the the sample that you've assigned to a certain pitch. Um, you can detune it. You can do stuff like that, or you set pitch. Normally, standard pitch is 15, but you can set it down as low as zero or one. And uh, so I set mine to 14 and five. Let's just hear how different they are. So as you can tell, they tend to get pretty distorted. Um, they can get pretty distorted when they're uh, pitched down. But um, just to demonstrate really quickly on one of my bass files, um, let's show you how you can make a, a drum beat with both the DPCM and the noise playing together. Um, we'll do hi-hats. Yay, all right, there we go, and we'll copy, and we'll paste. So, it sounds something like this. There we go. So, um, if we didn't have DPCM or we didn't have sampling right now with this uh, drum beat, it'd be a lot harder to do because we couldn't play this cymbal and this drum at the same time. We'd have to pick which one we wanted more, essentially. But um, this gives us more freedom and more volume of sound. Um, sampling is really effective that way. Um, Yes, any questions on DPCM sampling? Oh, one last thing. Um, I'll show you how to import a file too. So let's crack open a new thing. There we go. Um, and then, uh, right. So one last thing you can do, which you couldn't do back in the day, so we're very lucky that we have this, is you can actually import WAV files and make, the Family Tracker will automatically make it into a DPCM sample with certain limitations, which I'll demonstrate right now. So I have a giant, pack of drums that I use. Let's go with a cowbell, because who doesn't like cowbells? Uh, ooh, that one sounds good. Let's use that one. So I've got this WAV file right here, and I can I chose import, and then it opened up this. I selected my sound, and then I hit open. And now, um, this is telling me the standards that I want to import it as. So I can hit preview. Sounds pretty good. A little bit crushed, but they always do. 
Um, the quality is the clarity of the sound, so if it's really low, <laughs> pretty terrible. Um, but you could turn it up there. And oh, okay, that, that was bad. No, scratch that. Let's back up to this. Yeah, there we go. Um, in gain is uh, kind of relative volume, but remember that, um, what's the, I don't remember the musical, the musical term for when you're mastering something and it's so, the waveform is so large that it just hits. Okay. Clipping, thank you, clipping. Um, you'll clip if you go too high or too low. So if I turn it up to 12, <laughs> sounds pretty, ugh, a little garish. Um, zero is minimum, and then 12 is pretty uh, small sounding. So um, keep in mind that we only have a certain amount of uh, literal like space with each uh, DPCM sample. Uh, Family Tracker does follow the old rules in that regard. So if you had like a 20 second clip of a narrator discussing, uh, I don't know, uh, polar ice caps or something, you could probably only, when you imported it, it would probably only play like the first two syllables of the word because you'd run out of space. The higher quality, by the way, um, the, and the higher the quality, the, um, the less length that you'll have. So when I import custom samples, like for example, if I wanted to do uh, a Middle Eastern drum or uh, I don't know, uh, a, a certain cymbal sound, then I'd go into Audacity or whatever program and actually edit the sound so that I have it's as small as possible and it's it starts as immediately as the key is pressed. Because also if you have a, a white space in front of your sound, then all your samples will be off beat when you play them. So um, keep that in mind when you're importing, uh, loading, and saving. Um, after you've imported one of the uh, samples, by the way, let's just. to my ears. Um, you can then select that one that we made right there, hit save, and then it will save as a DMC. Thanks, Family Tracker. Um, what would we, we do without you? Um, okay, great. Um, so now we are, oh wow, it's already been an hour. All right, so let's move on to effects, um, and then we can go into expansion channels. Oh boy, this is going to be so much fun. All right, so um, I have prepared a, a uh, some sample files that show different effects. Um, after this lecture, I will send them to Ryan and he will uh, put it in a place where you guys can crack it open and take a look at it too. But let's talk about some of the different effects. Um, as we said before, effects are the thing that go into this channel and they affect instruments, AFFECT instead of BFFECT, in a variety of ways uh, affecting the timbre, the vibration, uh, the volume. Uh, we can do a lot of cool things that make them sound not so beepy. <laughs> um, so the ones that I wanted to cover today are 3XX, 4XX, 7XX, AXX, CXX, PXX, Q and RXX, and then some other fancy things. Um, so let's see. Yep. Okay. So 3XX, um, we just call it, um, you could just call it 3 or 3XX, um, is an effect that deals with um, portamento. And portamento is a musical term, at least relative to Family Tracker, that describes sliding between notes. Um, you can, as I said before, you can sing like ah, or ah, 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 ah. Um, and we're, if we activate 3XX, we're sliding in between the notes. There's no articulation between them, but it's one continuous sound that's moving up and down in pitch. Um, so it sounds like this. See how it's kind of sliding up and down the notes. If we delete it, come on. It's just moving manually. Um, there's no transition period in between that. Um, so you can do that with 307. Um, and uh, 3 is the effect itself. And then O, well, these two, O and O or O and 7, uh, is the speed. It'll go up to FF, and it'll if you go down to OO, it, there will not be any. Um, so if you want to kill an effect, generally um, blank OO is the way to do that. Set it to zero, zero, the amount of the effect. Um, you can set it to, z uh, if you set it fast enough, probably you won't even be able to tell. Yep, because the slide is so fast, it's the speed of the slide that it sounds like you're just jumping in between them again. So that's, uh, that is Portamento, that's 300. So let's keep going. Um, 4XX is an effect 
that affects vibrato. Um, you've probably heard um, opera singers, for example, hold a note and then at the end of the note they'll kind of have a vibration or a wavering in their voice to let it... Um, and that's something that the voice or the instruments naturally do um, to kind of the, the, the sound of the, the waveform naturally vibrates a little bit so that it carries the sound a little better. And um, we can change that with 400. So the note is going to start right here um, with no vibration. OO again is the way to kill it. And then we are going to change it to 464, which means that we are, uh, well, let's just hear it and I'll explain. Hear that? Um, and then we can turn it off again if we were to put 400 below it again. Um, but um, 464. So 464, um, 6 and 4 refer to the, um, the amplitude of the vibration and the speed at which it vibrates. So then if we change it to 4, F4, it means that it's vibrating very fast. Remember, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. Zero, uh, 0 to F. On a scale of 0 to F, how is your pain? Uh, <laughs> so, um, so F means it's a very fast speed. But um, if I change the, um, the amplitude to F, then it's vibrating, then it's, it's going up and down uh, to a much higher pitch and a lower pitch. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, the, the first is speed and the second is range. So, um, continuing on, 7XX. Um, 7XX is the tremolo effect. Uh, if any of you are guitar players, you'll probably hear this. Um, tremolo is um, vibration with the volume of the note, which is just here. So we start with 7 Um, so we can actually see in that, in that, uh, in our intensity bar right here with green, um, it's vibrating, but it's not the pitch in the note that's vibrating this time, it's the volume. Uh, again, um, speed and range. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, alright, next is AXX. Oh, any questions with effects so far? Are we all good? Okay, excellent. Um, Next one is AXX, and AX, AXX is a volume uh, decrease or increase. Um, in music, you might know this as a uh, oh, diminuendo and crescendo, I believe. It's been a while since I've done music, but I think that's correct. Um, so let's hear it. So we're starting at volume F, just to emphasize our point. Um, and then AO1 is going to make us slide down. And then A10 is going to make a slide back up. So let's see. Just like that. Um, so um, this one operates by slightly different rules than the effects we've seen before. Um, uh, anything in uh, the second number is going to uh, be the rate at which it slides down. Anything in the first one is going to denote the speed at which it slides up. So if we were to put a O F, it's going to slide down very fast, just like that. Um, but since we put one, it's a very gradual slide. Keep in mind, if you put a number in both of these, it, nothing will happen because it's trying to slide up and down at the same time, I think. Let's try it out. What happens? Yep, nothing happens. Okay. Um, Great. DXX and CXX. Um, so um, CXX, uh, okay, so DXX um, or D00 because they're, this one does not need um, intensity commands, uh, simply jumps to the next frame. So we start at, if you'll notice, if I delete this, um, there's actually a lot of space. There's a lot of rows left, but when we put a, a D00, it automatically ends the frame and moves on to the next one. So jumps right there. CXX, if we put it anywhere, it stops the song. Um, normally when you reach the end of your frames, it'll loop back to the first one. The first one that you had, usually zero, zero, but um, not this one. Ready? And stop. So if you have a song with a definitive end, most video game music tends to loop, but if you don't, um, if you're doing like a Bach concerto or something, then uh, put a cut there. Um, 
PXX. Okay. This one's this one's very important. Um, PXX is fine tuning, so um, it's literally uh, it's literally how sharp or flat the note is. Um, so as we can see, we start at a P80. P80 um, is the the is middle of the road. That's actually the tuning that all notes start on in Famish Racker. Um, uh, anything, um, any higher numbers, P82 onward is uh, is sharper, and then anything lower, 70 not 7F or lower is flatter. So um, as you can see, I've got gradual increases of uh, PXX right here, and that will uh, make the note grow more, sh more sharp, and then we'll start decreasing again, which will bring it back down. Um, this one's really important because if you guys have uh, if you guys have the same note playing in uh, more than one channel, then you're going to have synth clashing because the frequencies don't like that. Doesn't sound too bad, but if you put your headphones on, it'll make you cringe a little bit because um, notes uh, notes. The same note playing at the same time is a bad idea in, in chiptune music generally. Um, but if you uh, if you fine pitch it, then it actually come on, will be slightly better. And if you make them at slightly, even very slightly, uh, to almost indistinguishable from the untrained ear, um, then uh, the synths won't clash as bad and it'll sound slightly better. Did you hear it? Very slightly, it dropped out of, uh, it dropped out of the clashing. Um, I believe that's due, I'm not, a, I, I'm not a mathematician, unfortunately, but I believe it's due to the waveforms like sitting at the same space in, in yeah, the frequency. When they add, they do their, they do their right now, so. Yeah, okay, there you go. Sounds um, louder. Okay. Yep, sounds, sound clashing is bad, kids, don't do it. Um, Great. QXX. RXX. Okay. So, um, QXX and RXX are my favorite effects in all of Family Shacker. They're note slides or, or uh, glissandos. Um, that is from the French word glisse, which means to glide. Um, God, I love these. Um, if I could marry them, I could. Or if I would, if I could, I would. Uh, Q is the. Uh, QXX is a slide up, and RXX is a slide down. So, um, right here I've got Proto Man's whistle from Mega Man 3. We're going to listen to it with slides and without, and hopefully you can tell the difference. Uh, here it is with... And here it is with... Uh, here it is without. A little more boring, right? Um, still sounds nice, though. I actually... The original whistle is an octave up. I dropped it down so you could hear the difference a little better. Um, note slides add a little more flavor um, to it. I use them a lot um, because if you listen to someone sing, they will include these naturally. It's, it's kind of just a way that we uh, use it to make a, something sound nice. But also, um, you don't have to put the slide at the same uh, at the same row that the note happens, um, you could have a note that starts right here and then slowly slide it up like I don't know like that. Oh wait, hang on. So we start with a note and it slides up um, at whatever point. That way you don't have to break the, s the continuous sound right there. Um, so once again, um, Q starts it, or R, R slides down, there we go, um, one is the speed at which it slides, and four is how many notes it is sliding to, or from, um, so, uh, that's an F, so that's, uh, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, so it slides to an A, for example, um, all right, that's going good, um, triplets, yes, so the G, I'm going to Google this just to make sure I'm not wrong, but I'm pretty sure GXX is note delay. Um, 
Let's look it up just to be certain. Yep, GXX is note delay, so it actually um, stops the note from playing for a certain amount of beats, if you will, on not uh, hardware sweeps. I don't know what it's measuring in. But um, tripl triplets are when you're fitting um, three notes in the space of what would be normally two. Um, and normally, well, let's listen without and then with. quite as rhythmic and it doesn't sound quite as even. So now we've added triplets and let's hear it again. Uh, there you go. So um, yeah, keep in mind that's how you do it. Um, GO2 and GO4 is uh, the delay between the notes. Um, you will need to increase the number in between the second and third note of the triplet. Uh, the first note of the triplet does not need G anything that could be G zero zero if you want, um, but there needs to be an even interval between your triplets. Remember that. Um, that's the G. You, we can do that with the G command. Um, let's see. Say so, yep. Okay, great. Um, the next one is echo and reverb. Um, has anyone here played Donkey Kong Country? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so you'll probably recognize this song. I did a little version of it, and we're going to hear how we can add more echo and reverb to a song with just a couple amount of, uh, a couple channels. So let's hear it and then we'll we'll talk. Ah, sorry, I, damn it, Taylor. Screw it up. One more time. So that's that. Um so first right here we have no reverb tricks, if you will. There's nothing here, it's just it's just playing the opening of aquatic ambiance. Then I broke up the I broke up the the um, lead into two parts. And I put as one was playing, I started the other one so it could hold that note. So it sounds um, there's so there's no um, when a note starts again on this first part, it cuts out the other note. But here the note has a little room right here to speak before the next one happens, and it makes it sound a little more, have a little more volume to it. And then finally, the last trick you can use is um, single channel echo. And this one's kind of hard to do, but essentially, um, I played the note, and then I played the note again immediately at a lower volume. Um, so it sounds like this. If we slow it down so you can hear what we're doing with it, it sounds like... Which uh, doesn't sound so great, but then when you speed it up, it all flows together. Um, yay! Is there? Is that the last one? Uh, triangle drums. Oh boy! Who here has played old Mega Man? Yeah, there you go. Um, you'll probably recognize the sound of these, um, the triangle drums. Um, so as as I said before, triangle is normally used for bass. It's that low instrument that's not really affected by volume commands, but you can screw around with it and make it sound like this. <laughs> Yay. Um, and how that works is uh, we've got a volume command. There we go. We've got a volume that kind of falls a little bit, and then when you, you, we do have a release command at the end. When I release the key, it'll fall off. And then um, we've got a continual pitch command that is uh, looping, so it's continually dragging the pitch downward, and when you put it together, Sounds like that. Ooh, listen to that bass. <laughs> That's nice. Um, and I think with that, we can start pulling up specific examples. Oh, as I did before, um, Google Famous Tracker Effects List, and you can find a full list of effects that tell you everything, including the ones I didn't discuss. But if I didn't discuss it, we probably don't use it that much. So. Um, but always, as always, feel free to experiment. Um, okay, that's uh, vibrato, tremolo, volume, jumping, cutting, neutral tuning, brissandos. Yep, that's everything. Um, all right, expansion chip time. Um, you guys asked for it. Let's do it. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate. Whoa! I'm not going to demonstrate. <laughs> there we go. Um, it crashes sometimes. 
Um, the everything that I showed you, um, pulse, pulse two, triangle, noise, and DPCM are all only with standard family tracker. That's standard Rico two A O three, no expansion chips. This is the the stuff that was in most of the cartridges you played back then. But um, as time went on and we continued, people like me kept screwing around and making music and everything, certain companies wanted more types of sound. They wanted more volume in their sound. They grew tired of limitations. They wanted to add more samples. Whatever reasoning, um, different companies started adding more chips, literal sound chips, to their cartridges, which ramped up the price significantly, but you could get some really cool music out of it as a result. Thankfully, Famitracker does emulate most of those, and we can demonstrate those together, which I will show you now, hopefully. Um, this is going to look a little different on your version. Mine's OCC, as I said again. But um, basically, you'll have somewhere in module properties um, uh, abilities to add expansion sound, and um, this is going to be a lot of fun. So um, I'm going to turn on, let's just do all of them in tandem, I guess. I'll, I'll start with the FDS. Um, so as you can see, as we've added the FDS chip, this is the Famicom Disk System chip, um, uh, we've added an FDS channel that's just, it's, um, it was there. Wasn't included in our NES, uh, but it was for them. Um, listen to the, uh, listen to the uh, F, uh, FDS version of Metroid sometime. The soundtrack has added bass and it adds a wonderful set of ambiance to it. Um, so now we've got this new editor and oh my god, there's a waveform, we can draw it? It's like, what's going on? Um, <laughs> It sounds so much different. It's almost like an organ. Okay, that's cool. So basically, um, you can click these to affect the wave. Remember how I was talking about the volume wave? This is essentially the same idea, except it's the shape of the note rather than the volume. Um, we can change it to sign. this as bass because it makes for a really thick sound that and yes FDS can be affected by volume commands just like triangle couldn't so um, for example here's a cover that I did of a Yoshi's Island song and we can see how I used uh, FDS right here as a bass so take a listen So that's one way to use it, that's what I prefer. Um, so another thing that we can, let's see, that's FDS. Oh, another one I did. This is a song that I wrote actually um, a while ago. Um, and in this one I didn't use FDS as bass, I used it as the lead. Let's see if I can find a section where I... So um, take a listen to this and then watch the FDS channel and see where it comes in and see how it's being used. This time it's not being used as bass, it's being used as a lead. different waveform than we saw last time. Um, last time FDS was sawtooth, it was very straight like that. This time we've kind of got a more sinusoidal curve. I can't believe I just said that. Um, uh, in <laughs> that we used before. And it's got a smoother sound and we've got more pitch bends with that Q effect that I showed you and we've got volume fades. Um, the sound comes in and out and it's a little more gentler and a little more kind of forlorn and I think that makes for a, a very good sound for this song. Sounds like this. Keep in mind the versatility, the different options that you can choose, and again, don't just stick to the preforms of this, try drawing your own, you know? Uh, draw this sound, and then how does that change? It's probably going to be terrible. Oh, actually, it sounds pretty cool, but we wouldn't have known if we didn't try, right? <laughs> okay, um, that's FDS. Hooray, one down. Um, on and on. The next one that we're going to try is... 
MMC5, this one's really simple. It's literally just more pulse channels. Uh, <laughs> it's just too extra. Um, I recommend you turn this on at all times. Why not? If you're not, otherwise you'll just leave them blank and then you can turn them off again. But at the very least, modern, if you're going to do covers or arrangements or anything, nowadays there's more than three sounds playing at one time for the melody section. So add more volume. Uh, I don't think that's ever a bad thing. That being said, if you're doing like original Mega Man stuff, for example, um, they, Capcom, thought that expansion chips were the devil, and they didn't use them. So, um, I recommend MMC5 just because it's more pulse, it operates with the same instruments, you know, there's still 2AO3 th three instruments, same thing. Um, alright. VRC6 is, was the, uh, this was used in the Japanese version of Castlevania 3. Um, it was the only game in the U.S. And, oh, and LaGrange Point, I think, was the other game? I can't remember. Yeah, I know. Um, and US US version, US version doesn't use it, and that's ours is better because we have better arrangements for ours. And I'll fight me on that. Uh, and then don't. Uh, the the VRC6 adds a pulse one, a pulse two, and a sawtooth, but they are not our standard pulses. If you look and I make a new instrument with it, you can see that these are different um, because the VRC6 has a slightly reedier sound. Um, and the pulse width is actually different on it, um, slightly. Oh, well that's on the sawtooth, but um, if we listen to... Gonna work? Oh, yeah, if I, if I learn how to actually manipulate it correctly. Uh, there we go. Now if we compare that to a 2A03, you can see the difference. Kind of sounds more like a woodwind, in my opinion, but that's not the only thing you can do with it. You can also um, change pulse width like this. Um, People really, really like the sound uh, of this in the modern chip tuning community. As I said before, this is probably the most widely used um, expansion chip. And also you get a sawtooth, which is kind of like our sawtooth setting on our FDS either. Um, except um, this one uh, can't be, you can't really redraw the waveform on it that, that much, or at all. So drop it down and then, so you can use it as like a really thick bass. But again, I've seen it used for a variety of different purposes. Um, so that adds um, three channels to uh, ours as compared to the MMC5's two and the FDS's one. So feel free to experiment with that. Um, that's the Konami BRC6. Um, next is the, let's make a new file and then we'll move on to the VRC7. Um, Okay, this one is really, really cool, and I used to be, I really didn't like the sound of it, but then I experimented with it more, and it really kind of opened up to me. The VRC7 is the NES's attempt to kind of emulate FM synthesis, and that's uh, a kind of kind of synthesizer usage that we didn't really see largely until more of the, the beginning of the 16-bit era. This is the 8-bit era. But um, basically, we have certain presets with different sounds um, that we can select right here. If we make an instrument, once again, and then we open it up, we have custom patches, and that can do things like emulate a bell, a guitar, a piano, a trumpet, brass, guitar, xylophone. Um, they, a lot of people tell me this sounds a lot like uh, the old PC games, like uh, the Sound Blaster cards and Monkey Island and stuff like that, but I actually didn't, I never played those growing up, so I couldn't tell you. But, um, the, keep in mind that this is a lot different um, than what we normally use. Normally we were making our own instruments and we were understanding the shapes of the waveforms and the size and the pulse width and all that. We're not doing that here. We're picking from presets instead and we're seeing their different uh, qualities. But, however, there is a way to make a custom patch. You just choose 00 zero zero custom patch and then you can make your own instrument. But here's the catch. You can only use one custom patch at a time. You can't play more than one custom patch or there will be no sound at all. Um, so if you want to make a special sounding instrument that sounds not like your VRC7 presets, you can only use one at a time. You can make as many as you like, but one at a time. Um, so let's screw around with these and... Oh, 
swap them out. What do you mean? Like, let's say for one turn those on, you need one cut to pass. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can. But you can only play one at a time. So our question was, can you swap them out? Yes, you can. You can make a bajillion custom instruments, but uh, only one can be playing at a time. Um, you can play custom patches with other presets, though. That's totally fine. Um, I think this has to do with the memory limitations. Just the NES really was not that powerful to, in order to crank out sound like this. So I believe the VRC7 was only used in one game, and then they decided it was too expensive, and then they never built it again. But people really like the sound. So... Um, let me show you a quick thing uh, from one of the songs that I ended up writing with the VRC7. And I can show you how we can kind of emulate. Uh, no, come on. There we go. So right here in this section, uh, this was a song that I wrote for experimental game design, I believe. And um, so here we've got uh, uh, instrument 11, which is a clarinet. We've got... Uh, OE, which is a flute, and then 15 is a reed organ. So um, here we can just see kind of a different instrumentation style, and it sounds like this. very like normally it was all synthesizers and harder sounds but now we're starting to emulate instruments and we're kind of seeing different eras come together and that's uh, very meaningful in my opinion um, and uh, there's one more that I want to show you that's uh, that's one that I wrote really recently and this one shows VRC7 that I just showed you working in tandem hi there with the um, this is a guest lecture um, uh, this is a guest lecture okay yeah if, oh no problem you're welcome to sit in if you'd like um, <laughs> thanks um, so basically, um, we can see uh, the VRC7 patch, which I showed you before with kind of pseudo FM synthesis, working in tandem with all the stuff that I showed you from the 2A03. So um, as you can see, this makes just for like a huge amount of channels, but um, the sound is really cool. And it also shows that layering technique with the echo that I showed you earlier, so it sounds something like this. <laughs> an example of that. Um, and then, oh right, the RC7 rules. So, um, I don't, I'm not a master of knowing how it works, I know how to use it. So <laughs> this is going to be a little rough around the edges, but essentially there are two uh, waves that are being made with a VRC7 instrument. That's the carrier and the modulator. Um, the carrier produces a sine and a half sine, and the modulator takes one of the waves and modifies it with the other. Um, so that means that basically um, this is how the note starts, the, the initial attack of the note, and this is how it fades or holds or carries. Um, so this is the, uh, I, by the way, I don't know what any of that means, that's just, that's just what it is. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but, uh, so here we have this instrument that I used for this, and we can change the modulation level and... changes the uh, pitch exponentially, I believe. And then you can screw around with all the other stuff here. Um, to be honest, I, I just, oh, this is embarrassing to say, but I just kind of fiddle around with the sliders until I get the sound I want. <laughs> um, 
but you can do it in a variety of ways. Uh, one thing to keep in note, VRC7 volume is exponential. It's exponential. So your 0 through Fs will affect it much more, much quicker. So be careful with that. Um, then finally, um, we have the two expansion ships that are a little, much less used actually, and that's the Namco and the Sunsoft. Um, the N163 and the S... 5B, uh, the S5B you probably won't be able to access on standard family tracker because if, if I remember correctly that's only an OCC, but regardless um, the Namco uh, the uh, N163 is what was used in the old Namco arcade boards from the 80s um, I don't actually know if they were ever used in NES games, but there's supported chip here, so whatever um, they have adjusted wave editors, kind of like the ones that we were seeing with um, the FDS, you can draw it again you can select different sounds. Um, it's got a little bit of a it's got a little bit of a harsher edge. I usually don't see it being used, uh, but one thing you can do is add and select multiple waves, so you can save them just the same as we were saving blank instrument functions. And uh, obviously, the volume of the wave index is just uh, volume and duty noise, same as ever. Does that tune? Maybe not. Um, you'll have to experiment with that. Um, I don't use the Namco or the Sunsoft pretty much at all. Um, Sunsoft was actually only used in one game. Uh, it was called Gimmick, and it wasn't released in the U.S. So um, very few people use these two. So honestly, I don't have much information on them, but you'll have to experiment more and see how that works. One thing I can tell you that is really, really, really cool is um, the, uh, the last thing that I'm going to show probably will be... Uh, uh, DMC, D, DPCM base. So that was a trick. Um, as I said before, we can Im import samples, but we don't have to import just uh, we don't import just drums. Um, the company Sunsoft um, ended up importing bass samples, so they recorded an electric bass playing, and then they moved the bass line over to the DPCM channel, and then used triangle and noise for drums. So that way, that freed up the triangle channel. Um, this just gave a different sound, but let's hear it and then we'll isolate it and take a look at the different things that they did. <laughs> so, right here, we've got our pulses just doing harmony. Um, triangle is using that triangle drum trick that we showed earlier with the Capcom used. Um, noise is cymbals and drums. So we've already got two channels working together to already do the noise, so then what do we do with the uh, sampling channel? We actually record bass and put it in there. And that actually has a wonderful little thing that's still really popular uh, that a lot of people use. Um, keep in mind, this is probably, out of the, all the te techniques I've shown you, um, sampled bass is probably one of the harder ones just because of the fact that all the DPCM samples need to be tuned manually. Um, in the sample section with pitch, just like I showed you, and it's very hard to line up the pitches sometimes um, and keep the sampling rate from not like clipping and stuff. So um, experiment with that, but um, you know, start as you go. Um, so basically, finally, I just want to talk about um, kind of what you can do with Family Tracker generally. Um, I personally started just doing covers. I only I listened to game music that I liked and I tried to replicate it. And then eventually I went on to do different arrangements. I tried to add more of my own voice and my own style to the music instead of just copying it directly. And then eventually, after I learned uh, kind of the fundamentals of how chipped in music was made effectively by studying all the people that did it right, I was able to move on and write my own songs, which is what I'm currently more focusing on. So I would say that a great start would be to look at other people. There's a vibrant community of people that use Tracker and other trackers. Look at what they do. If they provide source files, crack them open, study them, figure out their instruments, figure out their tricks and their techniques, everything that I learned how to do that I taught you today, I taught myself from studying other people. Um, and uh, on YouTube, there's covers, there's, pe there's on Discord, there are communities that you can submit works to, and there are competitions. Um, there's like Winter Chip, which uh, every year they, they end up having chip tune competitions. That's actually how um, the Steven Universe team musical team ended up uh, doing chiptune work. They're, they have they submitted to um, older competitions as well. But um, basically on every level of how you use 
Family Tracker or any music program covers arrangements, replication, study, um, originals, um, there's basically elements of kind of expression. And always, I would say, always look to just kind of uh, insert your own voice and try to um, make the arrangement unique and meaningful in that regard. Um, because we're always working with limitations. We always have a, s a very small amount of sounds that we can work with, but then that really asks us to play to our strengths. How, how, if we only have room to make a melody, can we make it the best melody possible? Can we make it so dense and so vibrant that uh, people don't even notice that there's other limitations, you know? These are questions that you'll have to answer yourself, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. And with that, I think that's the end of the lecture. So, thank you very much.